She's the chair of the Caribbean African Healthcare Network, um, uh, qualified nurse, uh, doing a PhD, uh, Manchester, Manchester Metropolitan University, I think, Faye. Well, she can tell us later anyway. Uh, we're also going to hear from Rosie Holden, uh, who's a senior physiotherapist at Stepping Hill, um, and she's part of Christians in Caring Professions. Uh, and I'm Steve Taylor. Um, I'm a GP. Uh, I'm, I'm also a church leader. I lead South Manchester Family Church, but I've been a doctor for 30 years um, and a GP for the last 27. So uh, welcome everyone to this opportunity to gather together. Um, a couple of um, sort of admin notes as we go through. If anyone has any questions at all or any things they want to share um, as we go through or things that we can bring up in the conversation, um, if you put that in the chat, that would be a great thing to do. Uh, we might have the opportunity if numbers stay this sort of number uh, to, for people to put their hands up and ask questions. Um, and if we get that opportunity, we'll do that a little bit later. We, we had no clue tonight how many people were going to turn up. Um, it could have been just the four of us or as many as it is at the moment. So I'm just grateful that you're all here. Uh, some very familiar faces to me, some of you. Um, so I'm very happy to see some smiley faces that I recognise. It makes my life a little bit happier and simpler. Um, so um, just to explain, um, uh, Christians in Caring Professions is a brand new organisation. Uh, we started at the beginning of lockdown. Uh, Andrew Belfield and I have been having some conversations with some other people, uh, some of whom are in this uh, Zoom call. Um, and the, the thinking behind it was it's the opportunity for Christians who are in caring and uh, professions to just share their stories and have the opportunity to encourage each other in some way, uh, so to learn from each other, to encourage each other, to provoke each other. Um, and maybe just support each other. Um, so that's the thinking behind the organization. It hasn't got any financial areas. We are literally just a network at the moment. Uh, we started at the beginning of lockdown. Uh, we've got a Facebook group and that's it. So, um, so we're not particularly big, um, but we're trying to think of ways of encouraging conversations amongst people who work in health and social care. Um, particularly those two major groups, because we think there's, there's a real synergy between those groups and an opportunity as Christians to, to connect across those things. Uh, tonight, uh, the reason that we've decided that we'd start uh, with Faye, um, I mean, obviously there's been a, a massive pandemic that we've been involved in. Um, and that pandemic, of course, has had a huge impact. The reason we're meeting via Zoom tonight, um, and the, probably the reason why many of you have done everything via Zoom, some of you, and done church by Zoom, or even talk to your friends and family by Zoom is because of the pandemic, which is COVID. And that's had a huge impact, not just socially, but, um, but physically as well for all of us. Um, and then the other one um, in part has been um, the, the recognition of Black Lives Matters and the problems that we face in our society generally in terms of um, inequalities of, uh, well, probably inequalities in the healthcare area, but also within every area of society. So. We thought it was a good place to start. Um, it's a conversation. Um, we're amongst friends, hopefully. Um, so I'm hoping that you're all friendly tonight. You've got a smile on your face. Um, and have the opportunity to, um, uh, yeah, to ask questions and to learn from each other. Um, so I'm going to first introduce you, Rosie. Um, so Rosie, do you want to turn your mic on? Um, so hi, Rosie. Hiya. Hey, uh... So I've known Rosie for, oh gosh, goodness knows how long, 15 years probably, something of that time period, maybe less, but anyway, something of that sort. Um, Rosie, tell us a bit about yourself, what do you do and where, 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 what you're doing at the moment? So I work as a physio, um, trained in 2012, first worked at Withenshaw um, and then moved to Steppen Hill just over five years ago. So and sort of on the general wards, um, a mixture of specialities really. Um, at the moment it's mainly general medicine and surgery and a bit of acute front door stuff as well. So um, this time last year I had a conversation with you uh, about the opportunity maybe to encourage other people to, to connect up as Christians um, uh, and that was the one of the very 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 first conversations that I had with anyone about Christians in caring professions was with you. Um, why why have you got involved what 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 what's your thinking yeah it's been something on my heart um ever since i contemplated physio really um connecting christians within healthcare i think we are fortunate there's probably more christians in healthcare than 
we often realise there is. Um, but I think often we don't know each other. It's very hard to find time in work to talk about anything other than patients. Um, so ever since sort of working at Stepping Hill, um, I felt called to be praying regularly to connect Christians at Stepping Hill. And I prayed regularly with a colleague for a few years. Um, then he left and I still kept praying and just praying that that group would expand. And for the last sort of six to nine months, um, our group of Christians has really grown within Stepping Hill. So God's just been amazing, really. Um, I got connected with a group of pharmacists who turned out that they were praying together regularly already. And then that then led to us having a WhatsApp group of Christians in Stepping Hill. And we've now got over 30 people in the WhatsApp group. Um, and some of us pray together quite regularly. It's been a bit more difficult with coronavirus. Um, but we've tried to think outside the box with that. So we've had a Zoom prayer meeting and we've had some socials pre-lockdown and we had our first face-to-face -face meeting again the other day. So just trying to wait, find ways to connect and encourage each other really in what's a very difficult environment. Yeah, and uh, I think I, I think we found that even just talking, we talked about how how you might do a prayer thing over Zoom, didn't you? I think it was yeah. a, it was just it was just one example of the way we can encourage other as Christians because you hadn't thought about doing that, had you? So, um, yeah. do you want to tell me how that went? Uh, how that went? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was really grateful um, to our group really to suggest that because I was struggling over lockdown to find ways to connect, particularly because we couldn't meet in the chapel as we were doing. So I set up my first Zoom prayer meeting. Um, and yeah, there wasn't as many as I thought it was going to be, but I think that challenged me in itself, to be honest, um, just in terms of what our particular group want and um, what time they're available to connect. Um, but it was great to meet some new faces that I wouldn't have otherwise met in work time. And since then, we've set up a bit of a survey monkey to find out from the group what they feel they need from each other as well which has been really encouraging uh thanks rosie i, I think um uh, part of my reason um for inviting rosie to share this evening was to encourage each of us to think other ways of connecting in our work setting um or across work settings and i think one of the things that we're hoping to do over the next few months coming years is is create opportunities for people to encourage each other um, and sometimes that's going to be in similar groups. So, you know, um, in Rose's setup, it's just similar groups within one hospital, but it might be across, I don't know, social workers. Um, it might be across doctors. It, it may be a different ways of doing things, but it's different things that we can do. Uh, so the premise is that we'll, we'll find stories and encourage each other with stories. And maybe those stories stimulate something else that we can all do um, differently in our own setting, which might be something slightly different, but we could gain something from it. So I'm really hoping, uh, you know, through the groups that we've got. So we've got a Facebook group, which I'm um, more than happy to get you to join. Um, if you want to connect with me after this, um, you can do it in the chat and I'll send you an email or a link. Um, or you can just contact me directly um, via Facebook. I'll respond quite well in that area as well. Um, and, uh, and some of your friends anyway. So that's great. But I would suggest that we try and find ways over the, the coming months of finding ways of encouraging each other. I'd love to hear stories. Um, we've tried to share a few stories on the uh, Facebook page already. Joseph uh, has shared his story. I've had Jess share her story. And there are a number of other people sharing stories. And it'd be great to hear people's stories because I think stories are the way that we find out about each other and encourage each other, which is why tonight um, we've asked Faye to share. Faye, are you here somewhere? I've lost you on my screen. Um, oh, there you go, Faye. Say hi, Faye. Go and meet yourself. Hello. <laughs> I'm so here. Faye, hi, Faye. Lovely to have you. Um, I've not known Faye very long, but I've heard a lot about her before I met her. So I, I met Faye, I think, in the autumn, I think, when we were talking about Christians in caring professions. And, and Faye was really helpful in just in sharing some of her thoughts about how it might help. But I mean, as as covid happened and then has black lives happened i suddenly realized that Faye, you had so much more to talk into this than i ever could <laughs> um <laughs> and uh and you've probably got more experience I, I know i know you've done a lot of stuff you know um in terms of writing about this um as part of uh, caribbean african healthcare network you've written reports on inequalities in healthcare um and you've 
you know, really helped other people look and think about where those things are. So do you want to introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Steve. L lovely to see you again, and Andrew and Paul. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really great to be with you all this evening. And just to, um, as you say, you know, the title is about facing up to race. So there's so much to talk about and to have conversations about. So, um, so yeah, so I'm Faye Bruce and I chair the Caribbean and African Health Network in Greater Manchester. Um, I'm also, um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about how that started in, in a little while, um, but I'm also a, a lecturer in nursing, so I'm a nurse by background, but part of my presentation is actually to give you a little bit about me, um, and then to move on to why I have decided really to focus on health inequalities within the uh, black community. So I'll give you all, you know, a little bit more when I'm given permission to start um, well you have permission to start Faye um, it's I'll, just share my, I'll share my screen can you all see that I can see it Faye right. definitely okay. so. great right okay so um So I just want to um, spend some time just talking about, um, you know, some, some of the kind of background to myself, you know, and how I've come to be um, kind of working in the area of health inequalities, you know, what led me to, to, to do this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the past and to the present. So talking a little bit about some of that colonial history uh, and then moving on, and, and it's all intertwined into Caribbean and African health inequalities. And I just want to finish off because my PhD is due to be submitted in the next couple of months. And um, I just want to share with you some of my findings um, so far. So um, I just want to spend um, my next 20 minutes talking about those, those things. Okay. So I noticed that my, my parents were on the call actually as well. So um, it just, just a little bit about me, born and raised in Manchester um, many moons ago. Um, and my parents came here in the 60s from Jamaica. So they came, they had seven children. So I'm one of seven, the second oldest of seven children. And to say that I was brought up in the church, um, I, my, my dad, is a deacon, um, if anybody knows that church in Old Trafford without the steeple, um, that's where, you know, they um, brought us up really, we're really part of the church family um, in Old Trafford. So, um, and, and, and it was very, very much about a church family um, because, you know, all I remember being young, you know, when I was growing up, is all of the different things that centered around the church, you know, even at home, you know, the, the prayer meetings, the Bible studies, you know, people would come round and, you know, we'd have all of that church inside the house as well as going to church every Sunday as well. But I'll just say, um, and I'm sure my parents will probably be laughing um, at this, because my, I, I did leave school. I was quite naughty at school, actually, believe it or not. I was quite naughty. And I gave my mum and dad a real hard time, um, several times having the headmaster to come round and, and you know, um, because I was playing truant or you know doing something that I wasn't supposed to supposed to do and sadly I left school with no qualifications at all not one O level I left school with but I decided to do um, a catering course quite soon um, so I left school catering seemed to be the only place that would take me actually so I, I did catering with a friend of mine and that didn't work out for me either um, but one of the things that was really good that came from that is that I was sent on a placement to a place called Corner House in Manchester, if anybody knows it. it used to be on the corner just opposite the Palace Theatre. And um, I mixed with lots of different people there, but they're all university students. It was almost like the place to be to hang out. And I was really inspired, actually, to do something a little bit more with my life. So I, you know, despite having no O-levels, I decided to do three A-levels in a year and managed to pass my A-levels. 
and go to do my nursing, which is, was one of the first nursing degrees in the country at that time. So it was before that, it was Project 2000. Um, and then, um, we, you know, they brought in the degree. So I was one of the first people in the country to do that. So I was really proud of myself getting onto that programme. Um, but what inspired me to go into nursing was really kind of like being in the church and actually seeing so many people of colour, so many black people kind of becoming quite ill, you know, and, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, I, mum and dad would say about going to a funeral, I was only little and you're thinking, crikey, these people are really quite young and they're dying from all these different kinds of conditions, you know, like strokes and things like that and diabetes. And I wanted to do something to, to make a difference. I wanted to go and go into nursing and to almost kind of find out what was going on. So um, I, I did my, my nursing, my nursing um, degree um, and then I had my three children. But whilst I, I, I did practice for a good number of years, but whilst I was actually practicing, I felt that I wanted to do something a little bit more to actually impact on the way that nurses were actually being trained and taught because I could see some really poor practices within the nursing environment and I wanted to do something um, to change that and the way that I could change that really was about going into the environment in which they were being trained so that was me wanting to go into university education so um, so I did that um, did my master's in um, uh, public health related well healthcare management really again to try and ascertain what was happening within the community setting and how was the health system engaging with the um the black community so all of my work around the black community started really um when i started to teach and also to do my masters i did a mary c cole award which was really looking at um you know the health literacy of um black um, African Caribbean leaders within the faith setting. So I just wanted to see, you know, the, the number of congregants that they would have week by week, trying to uh, try to understand what was their level of health literacy when the congregants would come to them to ask them questions about, you know, health or, or look for signposting, you know, what was their understanding about all of that. And it's quite interesting, actually, because there was very, very little understanding about the system and how to navigate that system. And it, it was a big question mark over, well, what happens to these people when they note that they have, you know, any kind of health condition, mental health or, or otherwise, you know, what, where would they be directed to? Because we know that many of the pastors and church leaders are very trusted people. And they're often, you know, the person that the congregant would seek help and support from. And then whilst I was actually doing the Mary C. Cole, I was doing, um, doing my doctorate, which is where I am um, currently. Okay, so I just want to start by saying, you know, that, that there is something about being black that predisposes you to poor health. And, you know, if you know anything about the health of black people, you know, you'll see that, you know, there are many, many health conditions that we are more likely to be subjected to. You know, whatever the health indicator you look at, you'll see that black people tend to suffer really quite poor outcomes from, from um, a number of different things. You know, black people are generally largely marginalized, um, oppressed and experience a, a lot of disadvantage. So, you know, regardless of whatever sector or institution you look at, there is an incredible amount of disadvantage that leads to some of the health inequalities that we see and, and, and it's all over the world. I mean, I talk about the UK, but you know, you look at U the US, you look at lots of countries across Europe, you'll see that the disadvantage is very, very similar, um, you know, across globally. So health inequalities aren't new for black people. We've, we've experienced this for a long, long time. And, you know, when we talk about COVID and, you know, you know and again, you know, like what Steve had said, you know, we've had a lot to contend with, you know, all, all of us, regardless of whether you're black or white, you know, there's been a lot of issues facing many people through COVID. But what again was not, not surprising for us, because we, um, and when I say us, I'm talking about it at the Caribbean and African Health Network, is that we've been looking at, you know, how do we um, look at reducing health inequalities in a generation? So we, we know about all these health inequalities that we experience. 
and then when the um, pandemic was first announced, we had already put out a newsletter and said, look, you know, if you black people, you need to be more, you know, you need to be aware of, of some of the disadvantages that you will probably face because of being black. And then, of course, all these statistics started coming out of 4.9 percent and 4.8 percent. Um, and that's when they accounted for socioeconomic and underlying health conditions but still almost twice more likely to um, have the worst outcomes from COVID. Um, and, 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 and that was, you know, not particularly surprising again for, for us. We go through lots and lots of different um, statistics that we see in, in the black community to kind of like, you know, verify some of these health inequalities. So if you look at maternal mortality, absolutely shocking so we said craggy you know you look at you know covid and 4.8 percent but you look at maternity and you know that black women are five times more likely to die in pregnancy in in, in labor and suffer the worst complications of that um, and you can see that you know the statistics on there you know white women are seven in, in 100,000 asian 13 mixed race 23 and being black worst outcomes um, that you you will see in pregnancy Black babies are 122% more likely to die in the first month of birth as well. Shocking statistics, but we kind of like see how those kind of figures come to bear. And then again, looking at COVID, we can see that 56% of the total of, of pregnant women, um, most of those that were being admitted um, with COVID, obviously worse health outcomes or worse effects of COVID were from black or other ethnic minority groups. Other health inequalities, you know, if you are black, you're more likely to twice as likely to have a stroke and die from a younger ages. And that's the thing that we see a pattern right across, um, you know, all of these health conditions where if you are black and have a condition such as a stroke or diabetes and things like that, you're more likely to get at a much younger age than other, other groups. Black men are two to, two to three times more likely to have prostate cancer and twice more likely to die from it. And also, even though black women are less likely to have breast cancer, when they do get it, they're more likely to die from it. So pretty grim um, kind of statistics there, just about the kind of um, the, the kind of illness or the conditions that we're more likely to be exposed to. And, and there are many more. I could have had a long list for you today, but there are many conditions that we're more likely to be, um, you know, suffer worse outcomes from. But just, uh, you know, somebody who I quote quite a lot, Fanon, um, who um, gave some real good accounts around the collective and personal experience. And we're talking about way back in 1925, he was a psychiatrist. And he talks about the history of colonialism, racism and social justice, and how all these things will contribute to some of the physical and the mental ill health that we, that we see today. And we see this happening in the health service and it's a continued legacy of intergenerational trauma. So I talk about how these are intergenerational patterns. So often when you hear somebody saying, well, my mum had that or my grandma had that, you know, we see this kind of pattern that goes throughout the generations. In terms of some of the um, physiological differences, there are still a lot of like, you know, narratives and biases that we see today and in, in, in some of the training and some of the assumptions that people make about black people. So we're talking about, you know, um, some, of the, some of the curriculums and some of the way that people are actually taught, you know, where, you know, medical students approach patients with some, some of those underlying unconscious biases um, and we don't say that anything is deliberate, but what we say is sometimes it's about the way people are socialized. Um, and, you know, a lot of those false beliefs, things, and, and I'm sure many of us have heard it, you know, things that people say, black people's skin is thicker than white people's skin. You know, that black people's nerves end in a less sensitive, so we don't need as much pain relief. You know, there's a lot of these things that still we still hear about today. And, and there's a long, long list of things that we know are particularly damaging to, to black people and the care that they are more likely to receive. So some of the effects of, um, of kind of interpersonal racism. And so we, we know overt race, racial and um, hate crimes. Um, some of the racial microaggressions, um, which are very well hidden, very covert, 
um, and really undermining what that actually does to people and the impact that it actually has on people's mental and physical um, health. And we have this thing where we have this accumulation of stress which leads to the weathering we're talking about. So sometimes people say, oh, you know, black people, you know, when they're, you know, older, they don't look their age, you know, they look really fantastic. But actually, when you think about this weathering that actually takes place within the bodies, the physiological body, you know, we can see that, that we age so much quicker than any other group. And a lot of that is because that accumulation of stress and all of that depression and anxiety, you know, causes us to have many of these health conditions that we're actually seeing today. We can see some of the products of, of racial, um, you know, or racism, um, some of the institutional racism, um, the income inequalities, the underlying health conditions that I've mentioned, um, environmental issues, housing, you name it. Black people suffer disproportionate um, poor poor outcomes and poor access to a number of these different things. Unemployment is particularly bad. So even if, you know, I, my, my students might graduate with a, with a first or a two one, just like anybody else, and they go to the job market with the same qualifications or even sometimes better, they're still less likely to be offered the job. And some of that is about the pay differences as well. So what we already know about the, about the black community is we know that there are high prevalence of cardiovascular related diseases um, and that's how my PhD all started because I wanted a hook, I wanted something to hang my PhD on because if you think about cardiovascular disease, you know, largely, it's largely pre uh, preventable and why is it that the black community have not made the same level of progress as we see in other communities. So I wanted to use cardiovascular disease as that kind of um, thing that I could use to, to demonstrate some of the um, other issues that were going on. Cancers, you know, we, we had um, a session yesterday where we were talking about obesity and we were talking about how that can, you know, result in some of the cancers that we see. People say, well, you know, black people are what, you know, why are they getting liver cancer? You know, but then we link a lot of that to, to things like obesity. Uh, prostate cancer, I've mentioned, mental and emotional health, blood and bloodborne immunological conditions and the reproductive and sexual health. And not some of these I've already mentioned before, but again, we know that there is disproportionate um, health outcomes from all of these. And we, we see the problem. We see that there is poor access you know, we, we don't get the same level of, of good access to um, quality care. Some of that is culturally inappropriate um, and they are there for services that people tend not to um, associate with or feel comfortable using because they don't cater. It's like they've been forgotten. So um, they that there is poor access. It's not just about physical access. Sometimes it's about that cultural awareness. And, um, and also that sensitivity, there's a lack of trust in the system as well because of lots of things that have gone on in the past, the way that people have experienced or even how people perceive the care that they're going to get will also you know, result in that lack of trust. And when people get the care, they're more likely to get it late. Um, and, and that again links to some of that lack of trust inadequate knowledge of research, very few, you know, limited amount of research that we have around black health issues um, and also the structural and systemic issues, lack of investment in black um, people in general. Structural um, and um, the barriers really, looking at the decision making and representation, again, we know that there is very um, few black people at the top in decision making. So we have a lot of that done to us or for us and very, very little involvement of black people around the table to actually enable that the care that they're, or that they're providing is going to be suitable to meet our needs. Benchmarking is a real big issue um, for the black community and probably other communities as well is that we tend, because we're minority groups, we tend to have to kind of almost fit in to the, the, the majority. So whether it is something like a screening program, so if you think about, you know, the health check, for example, the health check is, you know, everybody over 40 goes for their health check, you know, it's an NHS funded program. However, 
if you know remember what i was saying earlier about how black people tend to arrive at some of those health conditions earlier and things like blood pressure i mean we did screening for over 600 people um in churches over two three four events we screened all those people we referred nearly 50 percent to their gps for high hypertension and atrial fibrillation those kind of things so why aren't we testing people earlier if they're in a, in a high risk group there is also the racial discrimination and the conscious bias i've mentioned before and also the um, poor community engagement and investment um, and especially within the faith sector because as i said earlier you know when you think about the thousands of people that pastors and church leaders have access to why is the nhs not engaging with them they are a perfect um, platform for people to engage with and um, to actually disseminate health prevention messages so um, again just a little bit about biology versus the systemic um, barriers you know when we say that actually there's more difference between um, within the races so there's more difference between me and somebody else that's black than there is outside and there's lots of evidence to prove that um, black people are no more genetically predisposed to for example i've just used covid because that's where i can see some of the, the discussions and the narratives going around well black people are more likely to get covid and suffer worse outcomes because of their genetic makeup and we know there is no difference it's a bit like maternity you know there's nothing that you know predisposes us to actually dying in pregnancy as you know in comparison to white people so um, there is nothing genetically different. We have a higher burden of, of chronic disease. And I've mentioned as well about those everyday stresses uh, of racism and discrimination that causes like a, a change in that genetic expression over time and it leads to that higher rates of mortality and morbidity. And if you look at these toxic com combinations, it puts us at more risk of complications from, for example, coronavirus. So CARN, um, the Caribbean and African Health Network, has been going for three years and we're all about reducing health inequalities, influencing policy and practice. So we're responding to a lot of what we already know um, and you know, it's about us getting around the table because we know that there are huge gaps there. We have a collect collective action approach to challenge that the unjust, inequitable and unfair systems which negatively affect the health outcomes of black people. We work with decision makers. We um, look to shift that power to one where the voice of black people are heard. Because we often say we're not heard and people kept saying, well, you're hard to reach, but we're not hard to reach. We just weren't given the opportunities to be heard. People were not coming to us. And as a community, we're really involved in co-designing services that are culturally and religiously appropriate, because those were the things that were particularly missing from a lot of the um, information that was being disseminated. At the start of um, the pandemic, so in April, we decided to collect the experiences of black people to find out how they were actually coping through COVID. So we did like a three week survey, which gathered the views from over 300 plus people, um, just to kind of share, you know, what, what kind of things were they doing? What were their challenges? And, um, you know, there was quite a number of different things that came up, but I just wanted to point out this one figure, which talks about, um, you know, we, we asked them about the services, you know, and, and how they wanted services to be provided. And this was, you know, the most, you know, shocking fit. Well, I say shocking, but not surprisingly shocking, was that of the people that completed the survey, 74% of people wanted culturally and appropriately, appropriately black-led services. And that is largely because of a number of the different things that were people were experiencing in the past. You know, many were hearing about people that were, um, you know, had friends or family working in the NHS, you know, that were being treated poorly. And if you've read Kevin Fenton's report, you'll see, you know, some of the um, the racism and, and the lack of, of um, you know, care given to black people, some of that resulting in some of the terrible mortality rates that we actually, you know, we, we, we know about. So that was something that was quite, you know, um, a big statistic for us in terms of that's what black people were asking for. And, and just to finish off, some of the findings from my, my PhD, um, 
I had hundreds of people coming to, to actually take part in some of the consultations that I was doing. And um, interestingly, what the thing that was coming out was, even though they didn't use the terminology, it was about how um, we need to kind of, you know, decolonize some of the, you know, what we actually have in the health service. How do we break some of that down through their voices? How, how do we use their voices to, to do that? Um, and it's all about breaking down the, the power structures that result in the health inequality. So people were talking about some of the barriers, whether they were running an organisation and didn't know or, or, or wasn't getting the, like the level of investment. And there were lots and lots of different things that were, that were coming up. But the most key thing was about, you know, in every sphere, whether it's economics, whether it's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence that, you know, make decisions about... Um, you know what drugs people get or what what kind of you know interventions people get it's about how do we break those down and get the voice of the black person in there to actually say well actually what about us so we need to have that storytelling we need our voices to be heard we need people to listen we need to engage in conversations and take action to address the health inequalities for black people and some of that is lobbying and campaigning when khan is doing a lot of that um and, and what we're saying to people is that it's not enough to say I'm not a racist, you know, because many people say that, but actually what are you actually doing to challenge racism and discrimination? And we, to see a change, we need to work together to stamp out that inequity and that unfairness. And, you know, I just want to leave by saying, listen and check your privilege. Accept the system has been weighted to favour white people and that's been going on for generations. And we need to get to that place where we have a level playing field. And thank you very much for listening. I've probably gone way over my time. No, thanks, Faye. I mean, that's really helpful um, in terms of starting our conversation this evening. Really helpful. Um, I mean, a number of things um, strike me. And I think as a church leader over this uh, past few months, um, just being um, more aware of my conscious and unconscious biases um and uh, uh you know you know you know i can't hide the fact i'm a, a middle-aged white guy who's who's become a doctor so um the fact is that that a lot of those privileges that i was completely unconscious of um in terms of growing up i've become much more conscious of um and i think um i think that process that we're all going through in terms of being educated and understanding is really helpful and i think this part of the conversation that you shared today as has been really helpful. Um, I mean, I think one of the things I would say, uh, as people think about questions, if you've got any, I've, I've got one from Andrew in a, that's gonna come in a minute. Um, but if you've got questions, I'd love to hear them. I think we're in a small enough group that you can put your hand up or put one of the ways on chat and uh, we'll, we'll, make, we'll, you, we'll, we'll let, let you have the opportunity to ask your question directly. Um, but I, 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 you know, I, there were some very simple things that I've noticed even as a medical doctor, you know, for example, I saw this amazing book that, uh, a young uh, medical student had written about uh, rashes in dermatology, and uh, uh, and he had he uh, he he put together at Imperial in in London uh, a book that helped people understand how rashes affected people of colour, uh, because all the pictures in the dermatology books were <laughs> based on white people, which is just ridiculous. Um, and um, uh, and I've got to say that that that's that's something that would just caught, caught me by you know i just thought wow what a simple example uh, of of something where actually things aren't being taught well and um uh, so there are a number of other things and i and i think you're right about covid and it, and it's highlighted a number of inequalities um in terms of health um not not just because of the death rates which are you know two to three times higher amongst black and ethnic minorities um i think it's also the the uh, you know the the ability for people to reach into those areas as well and actually come and hear and, and come forward with illness i think that's one of the other things um so really helpful um so andrew grayson um uh, andrew nice to see you um has asked this question are the ccgs listening to you so the cl clinical commissioning groups um so the cl clinical commissioning groups for those that don't know are uh, they're in charge of general practice so they're in charge of uh, people like me um and my partner who's uh, is, the, is the chair of my local CCG. So actually speaking to me, Faye, could be really helpful uh, because I can speak to my colleague, uh, Jeff, who's actually chair of a CCG uh, in Berry. So, so that's one of the amazing things that we can do as a, 
a connected group of people is that we can actually maybe have influence across in different sectors. So are the CCGs listening, Faye? Are the CCGs listening? Right. Well, so we have um, a number of relationships with some CCGs across Greater Manchester. So that's really good. And we're really, as Khan, I'm talking about as Khan at, at the moment. Um, and, you know, particularly, I, I'm not going to name them, but, but, but there are some good relationships. I think what tends to happen is that, you know, as I was saying before, health inequalities in the black community is not new you know we've known about these things for, for a long time and i think i mentioned what, when i did my masters um in gosh it was 2008 and it was the then pct and i was then saying look crikey you know we we've got these health inequalities we know that you keep saying these people are hard to reach why aren't you going out there and talking to these people and doing all this health prevention work um, and it's, it is quite unfortunate to say, you know, years down the line, we still see a really slow response to addressing some of the health inequalities that we see. We still see that, you know, as Khan, for example, we have to do a lot of the legwork. We do a lot of health education and prevention for the communities, and it's not necessarily supported by the CCGs. Um, and, and some of that is just about investment, investment in resources and, and you know, putting information out coming and speaking to people you know we see um you know not as much happening there as what we would like to see so you know there is always a lot lot more that can that can be done but we are um, there is one good piece of work that we're doing at the moment with one of the ccgs and it is looking at addressing um health inequalities in the black communities so that's um one of the ccgs where we've got like a project that is going on and it's called knowledge awareness um and charles can help me out with you know? um but basically it's screening and opportunities and it's and it's about you know i was saying before that we've done over 600 screens on for black people on blood pressures and atrial fibrillation and we've referred a lot of people and so basically we've started this project which is which we are looking to um do a lot of you know kind of tailored education leaflets and um, create ambassadors and that is very well supported by the ccg well it's funded by the ccg but we need a lot more we've got we've got 10 in greater manchester and we have a couple of you know fairly good relationships with ccgs at the moment so steve i welcome you you, you know you're <laughs> being chair of Barry because we you know we, we really do need to link with them because the investment isn't really there to actually sure. address a lot of these issues. Yeah, and apologies to Jane, that question came from Jane Grayston. Andrew's not here. <laughs> so thanks, Jane. Um, so that was just me trying to read the chat without actually um, uh, seeing, seeing who was asking the question. So thanks, Jane, that's really helpful. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions or anything, any comments they'd like to share? Um, you can use the wave function um, or just say something. Charles, do you want to add anything? I mean, you, you've been involved with Calm for a long time. Um. Th th thanks, Steve. Yeah, so I, I've been the chief officer, and prior to that, you know, used to be director of a strategic partnership. So a lot of knocking on doors across GM, and, and the frustration is, you know, we could be a lot smarter than we are. So currently, during the COVID situation, if there's a spike in Salford, then we get invited. Can we have a conversation about test and trace? how we reach the, you know, the North African community, for example. And in Manchester, you having similar conversations, part of a, an equity group, weekly meetings, and, you know, let's target the churches and local groups. And then in Rochdale with a spot. So, you know, for a small organization without any core funding, you know, having to have 10 conversations, you know, telling the same story, repeating yourself, suggesting the same strategy, sometimes it could be really frustrating. but you know, we really committed to the community and we keep pushing, we keep knocking on the doors. And at the moment, uh, there are various bits of work, you know, trying to engage the GM Health and Social Care Partnership. Thanks, thanks, Charles. Um, I, I think you did a report, didn't you? Or a faith audit report on mapping health care provision and well-being and advice services based uh, around um, faith-based organizations. I, I'm sure that's true. Um, the, um, were there any good points? Anything that, that the churches and faith-based organisations are doing well? Um, anything that you you would sort of highlight as highlights? Well, I, I, th I think that there's so much value places of worship, you know, or faith groups bring to the party. 
And, and I think it's on two fronts. On the one level, it's about getting faith groups to understand the language of the health and social care system and to be able to use that. So whether it's around social prescribing or articulate, you know, supporting to combat loneliness and isolation and all the low level underlying mental health issues, you know, but then also how do we get faith groups who just want to, for example, during the pandemic, give out food, but don't want to connect with the local authority because they feel that will be taken away from them. So at GM level, we, we, we've been able to develop, uh, it, it was originally meant to be a faith and health MOU about how the health system works a lot more closely with, with faith groups and, and faith organizations and also understanding the provision currently you know, by places of worship. So I know Andrew and others, for example, Andy Burnham is committed to come summer, you know, <laughs> no child should go hungry. And he's looking to the churches to be able to develop something, you know, to that effect. Faye, do you want to add anything to that? Any highlights for you? I think the uh, the, the, the highlights, I mean, it was, it's, you know, we did uh, quite a small scale, if you like. It was, it was a, a very quick report that we did on, on the faith section. It wasn't just the black, black faith section, it was all faith sectors to see what, what they were doing. Um, you know around around health and i think what what came out really strongly for me is that the face set to really want to do something you know they really want to do something to address uh, or or to to um to get involved in delivering some of these health messages and and i think it was such a shame actually because you know two three years down the line we haven't really moved forward with that because one of the things that we we note all the time is that you know many of the just taking the black you know okay. churches again is that they are not funded they're not supported like you know the, the church of england for example and you know if they, they want to do something they need some kind of investment in that so you know there's a real frustration really because they want to do something but they don't have the level of investment in order to do that and we need you know the system to recognize that that is something that actually could make economic savings for them in the long run if you get hundreds of people in, in a church and you can give health prevention information or you can do various different things, you know, that is going to cost, you know, it could potentially save you people getting ill out and having to use the health, you know, secondary health care services and primary health care services. So what, what we're asking for is an investment into the faith sector. And we know that the willingness is there. It's not their core concern because their core issue is about how they address the spiritual needs of their congregants. But, you know, but from a biblical perspective, we know that the body is a very important, you know, temple as well. And we need to be able to look after that. So, you know, it's, it's about, you know, the system recognizing that there needs to be some kind of investment. The willingness is there. You know, we, we just need to get on with some of the findings, implementing some of the findings from, from that. And just to say as well, you know, some of the work that Khan is doing around um, some of the, with primary care is, what well, we're hoping to do with primary care is about how we educate uh, medical doctors um, and, and the primary care team about um, the differences or the needs of black people. Because, you know, again, through some of my research, you know, many people were saying that doctors just don't get me, they just don't understand me. You know, and they end up, you know, going to the to the consultation and leaving probably in a worse situation because they might be left with, you know, leave left with some medication. But actually, is that medication going to be helpful? And it's, is it going to address the right, you know, concerns that they have? But, you know, it's about getting, you know, primary care to understand the the um, health needs of, of the black community from a cultural and a religious perspective as well. So hopefully the partnership will um take us well we can get on with that piece of work as well yeah that's really helpful um i mean i i a couple of the little notes that i've made i think um i mean i, I and i think um jane also mentioned this about the herd, higher burden of life stresses experienced um um by well yeah you know black and ethnic minorities i think that that's true of, of many and certainly listening to stories over this last you know four six eight weeks i think has made me realize the number of stresses that people are under that are, are sometimes hidden um so uh, and I, you know even having conversations with uh, uh, joseph uh, when we did our video 
um, it was clear that he, his, his journey as a doctor was different to my journey as a doctor, um, including um, being stopped by the police, which he, he had been, but I hadn't been. So I think there's some different things. Joseph, have you got any thoughts in terms of what you've heard this evening? I, I know I'm picking on you, but... Um... No, that's fine, Steve. Um, <laughs> you, you can pick on me any time. Um, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Faye for the excellent presentation. There are a number of things that I picked out. I mean, I've, I've worked as a doctor in the Greater Manchester area now for uh, close to 16 or 17 years. And I don't really recognize some of these statistics that you've got in terms of the inequalities. In other words, we're not aware that these things actually exist. I happen to also be in a position where I'm a pastor and I totally get what you're saying because I get members after they've been to their GPs just because they know I'm a doctor, they ring me to say, well, they've given me this medication, should I really be taking it? I'm like, you know, why didn't you have that conversation over there? And they were like, well, they don't get me. And, and so I, I get that a lot, an awful lot. Um, so I really, really do, a lot of things resonate with me. I've been really quiet and pondering how to go about tackling all this because I, I've known Charles for a while and I know he's, he's really poured his heart and soul into into Cannes and you know all the things that I'm just thinking from our point of view what else can we do as clinicians Steve how how can we how can we help to sort of make this better in in a way what what can we do I know we're talking to the CCGs should we be um, going to the RCCG well RCGP for example and trying to make some dif in, in, make some differences with the curriculum because I'll give you a very practical example when I worked in Harpohe skin conditions. All the black ethnic minority patients came to me because I could identify the skin conditions and I could deal with it much quicker than my white colleagues could. It, it wasn't, it was just, it just happened. And at the time I was, I was really younger and I didn't really think anything of it. But now, now that you've mentioned it, there's a number of things that I think, and I think it's a, it's a multifaceted issue, but it's a good thing to start a conversation on it. I, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've been a trainer, a GP trainer for uh, 16 years, and and um, the majority of my trainees are, are from black and ethnic minorities. Um, and I've had two uh, two black uh, colleagues, and uh, and the rest of them have been from uh, Southeast Asia and Asia. Um, and I think what's clear to me is that that we do have a responsibility as people christians first of all but as people that are connected together um you know one of the great things about being the church is that we're one people under god um and and that gives us a huge advantage in some respects because we are connected in a wider setting than some other people are our bubble is bigger um and it gives us a real good opportunity to to cross cross barriers that other people just haven't got the opportunity to do i mean like we're doing tonight you know the the number of different colored faces across this screen indicates that we can do something so much more different than than other groups can as as the church um and i i'm i'm sort of hoping with christians in caring professions that we can have the same sort of impact uh where we encourage and provoke each other to be supportive of each other um, um how we do that is a good question i mean i i, I you know i've done a number of <laughs> personally i've supported um the unconscious I, I've fought against unconscious but unbiased within the Royal College of General Practitioners for the last 10 years uh, with review to their exam and I continue to fight for uh, equality in that area because I think it's been a big problem um, so I think there are things that we can all do I think in, in our different settings but I think we can encourage each other can't we I just wonder whether anyone else has got any thoughts I'm missing some of the chat at the moment so um, it's mainly coming from uh, there's a good comment from Jane. Uh, so the City Sanctuary have created some GP practice training around mental health needs of asylum seekers. Um, so that, thanks, Jane. I mean, Jane, do you want to say anything about that? Can you speak? You're on mute at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. Um, uh, I did some training at uh, Hawthorne Medical Practice um, that the staff really appreciated. We, um, I was working with Joe's. Uh, uh, Jonathan Kazembi, um, who works for, um, what's it called, My, uh, 
migrant voices or it's something to to do with um free from part of freedom from torture where they trained up um people who are torture survivors sure to, uh, to speak and tell their own story and i think un unless we have more understanding of um of trauma and its effect in as Faye was mentioning kind of intergenerational trauma um, that's passed on we will not understand the roots of the of our health inequalities whether from people who have long roots here back three and four generations or new arrivals who are uh, almost totally uh, sure. black and Asian uh, minority ethnic background people and um, are who, who then go on to provide lots and lots of our care. Um, sure. Amazing. Yeah, so I think you're right. It's, it's that sort of thing, isn't it? It's where we can, en can engage um, in what we're doing. So bringing what the skills and the opportunities that we've got to, to speak. I mean, I think, I think um, Joseph made a point about, um, you know, engaging in CCGs, which I think is a really important thing. Um, uh, probably what we need to do is get people like Faye and, um, and Charles in front of those CCGs and we can be the introducers to those people. You know? So maybe, so, so, so sometimes that's the opportunity that we have. Um, I think within social care, you've got the same issues um, and, that, you know, it's not just healthcare issues, it's social and healthcare. So I think it's finding different ways to do that. Um, any other thoughts people have got? I, I, I put something in the chat about um, something Faye said about tapping into the resource of uh, faith leaders. And I think it's a really, really good point in terms of engaging faith leaders, whether that be AME or not. Um, I think it would be really, really good because the number of people in our congregations that have health conditions that uh, for various, various reasons, whether cultural or uh, spiritual reasons, they don't want to go to the GPs uh, or they don't want to, I think it's really important to push that. Uh, let me say to Faye and to Charles, I happen to sit on a board in Rochdale uh, that you may be able to get some more leeway with if you want to deal with the Rochdale area. I can't comment about any other part, but as far as Rochdale is concerned, we might be able to do something. And this is really why we need to be having these conversations a bit more in terms of being able to interact. But I think that's a, a really untapped resource in terms of getting across to faith leaders and getting the faith leaders to get the congregations to get more better healthcare. Yeah, and I think both uh, uh, Joseph and I are, are, are well connected, let's put it that way. So we're connected both in health and uh, and we're also connected in church leadership forums. So we, we've probably got access to a lot of people, um, as has Andrew as well and uh, others. So I think, we, I think that's the great thing potentially about these conversations that we're having. We've got better ways of connecting um, in different ways. I'm just having a quick look at the chat. Um, we, we welcome those offers and we will be taking you up on that. <laughs> you get an email tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I mean, I, I'm more than happy to get emails. Um, can, can I just ask, obviously, the, the kind of medics on, on the call as well. You know, I'm thinking about um, access to the medical training. So, you know, I know that in, in nursing, I try to influence as much as I possibly can about some of the um, differences between you know black and white people so when you talk about skin rashes and we talk about pressure area care and how do you actually you know um, spot that on a black person compared to you know I, I do all of that I do all the clinical stuff and you know and I can eject that as much as I can I'm just wondering about you the medical training um, and whether there is anything that you can do to influence any of that I mean I also um, a patient and public voice rep for the um, NHS England for maternity and I've been involved in some of the ARCOG, the Royal College of Obstetri Obstetricians and um, Gynecologists to influence some of the work going on there um, and I bring it up there you know what kind of training do you, do you get you know how 
you know, are you teaching and training your, your, um, you know, your students about the things that you, you talk about jaundice and, and, you know, just, just different things. Yeah. So I think the influence in, in kind of medical school is really, really important. Like I was saying earlier on, you know, is there anything that you could do there um, to influence? Does anybody teaching the universities? So it's just a question out to yourselves. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, I think the answer is that um, we certainly have, I, 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 I'm pretty well connected as a trainer uh, and I could probably start pushing some buttons in terms of talking to the head of the Northwest training for general practitioners. Um, uh, just because I know them, um, I've been around long enough. So there are, there might be ways of, of getting you onto the curriculum of the GP trainees um, uh, in some shape or form in terms of a, you know, sort of teaching se session, uh, which I think would be really helpful for them. I think it'd be really helpful, um, you know, potentially. So, I mean, that's, that, this is a really good example, isn't it, of the way we can connect across different things. Mm, um, mm. So I think it's a really helpful. And, I, I, you know, I was thinking about even within the context of our hospitals or, um, uh, you know, uh, the different settings in which we all work. Um, it's how we encourage each other, isn't it, and listen to each other. I think one of the big things for me over the last, I mean, a few months potentially, but um, is, is that we listen to each other's stories um and actually try and understand what the journey has been like um because i think i think that's the challenge so joseph's journey to being a gp in rochdale is a very different journey to my journey to becoming a gp in berry which is next door um you know and I, I think it's 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 understanding that i don't want to make it too gp focused um <laughs> or doctor focused but i think there are different things that we can look at in that setting aren't there um e uh, Please, sorry, can I come in? The, the other issue we lobby at GM level is with sickle cell. Do you sure. know, and what we're asking is if we have devolution in Greater Manchester, why is it that you know outside London, GM has the biggest population of people living with sickle cell, and yes, there is no GM priority. We understand this commission at northwest level, sure. but what can we do locally? You know, so we were invited by African Caribbean medic students, they get five minutes on sickle cell during their training but we know this is a condition that predominantly affects black people and and what we keep saying to commissioners is you know joe blocks on the street isn't concerned about specialized commissioning what they look at is the patient experience and the journey and the fact that people living with sickle cell can't hold jobs you know we we have uh, reverend anthony mason for example who has who runs sickle cell care in manchester supporting people who, you know, right through the tribunal, sometimes supporting people to get two, three years back payment. So, so I think there are things we can really look at and, and, and you know, influence. And, and I think the teaching is important. And also there are things we keep campaigning at GM level. And I think having support of, of clinicians and, you know, professionals like yourself, putting your weights behind that. So one argument we've been making is if pride in practice over the last three, four years, you know, has improved the outcomes for the LGBT community. And as a black community, we're putting forward a proposal, you know, to improve health and well-being. Then we need the support of the system. And, and that is the argument we're making at the, you know, at the moment. And, and so as soon as it's kind of agreed, having, you know, you guys put your weights behind it will be really, really useful. Charles, you make, you make an excellent point. Um, I, I'm sorry, Steve, I don't want to make this too um, medically inclined as well, but he makes an excellent point in terms of, I have been worried and I've been pondering about that as well. Um, and I think it's really good that we're having this conversation because I think this kind of forum can actually give us ideas on how we can tackle these things. Sickle cell is huge uh, and it's something that really should, there should be more attention given to it. So Charles, by all means, grab us, grab Steve and, and every other person there. I will be pushing it at my end as well. Speak, going back to Faye's question, I happen to be involved in teaching medical students um, and I'm soon to become an OSCE examiner. The, the thing though is that it's, it's not really come to our awareness. So for me, who is a black ethnic minority, I wasn't even aware of some of these inequalities. You know, you get so bogged down with, with work and doing all the things that you do. Uh, and I, so I think 
obviously you guys are doing an excellent job. I think part of the assignment you may want to have is to educate us a bit more about some of these things so that we can be aware and then we can then sort of support that and push these things to the places and to the corridors where it needs to be heard. Can you please tell that to the partnership? Because that's exactly the piece that we're doing at the moment, that, that like Charles was talking about, you know, which is similar-ish to Pride in Practice. And it is all about education about some of these issues, these health inequalities, and, and almost pricking people's consciousness to think differently about how they approach patients, black patients. So, you know, that, that is what we're, we're kind of like having discussions about, but it's very, very much about education for primary care and, and across the healthcare system. I mean, we're doing it for the police at the moment as well, because we know about the impact that, you know, policing has on, on black people, stop and search, and, you know, the impact that that's going to have on people's mental well-being. So we're actually involved in, in so many different things, but education is absolutely key. So again, thank you for the offers. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, for the rest of us that aren't perhaps as well connected, the opportunity is to pray, isn't it? Um, and, and, and support each other in prayer as well as everything else. And actually have our conversations within our own churches um, uh, and the groups of people that we mix with. Because I, um, I think that's the other opportunity that we have to do. So um, we, we, can, we can encourage each other. And I think what I'd love to do is to feed um, back... Um, to, uh, you know to feedback from other people this conversation because we're going to it's going to be shared uh, this this chat we're having now is going to be shared so you can share it with other people um and so it's just it's an opportunity just to say here we go have a have a look at this yourself and there are other other opportunities to share in that i think we are going to draw it to an, an end this evening um what, one of the opportunities um that we have um is just to maybe just to have a personal reflection we're we're christians or, well i think most of us are um I don't know that for a fact, but I, I, th I assume most of us are Christians that are here. Uh, we've come by way of invitation. Um, uh, Andrew uh, Belfield suggested that we listen to a song, uh, which is uh, been written by, I, I can't remember. Andrew, do you want to introduce the song? Because that would help me probably. Yeah, so the song is a new song by a singer-songwriter from Ireland called Andy Flanagan. And it's about um, very much of a contextual base of um, the famous saying of one of God's names, Emmanuel, um, with us. And it's um, really poignant. And I think it'd be good as we come to an end um, and you know all the things that have gone on, which have been fascinating. And once again, Faye, thank you so much for sharing so much wisdom and knowledge. And we'll certainly be, as part of CICP, taking it away and thinking and reflecting of how we can respond and for everybody coming in. Um, it's really good. This is one of three um, particular Zoom gatherings. Um, and if you want to find out more, if you go into the Mosaic Justice Network net, um, website, you'll find out when the next one is, which I think is next week. Paul Keeble may be able to tell us that. I've been out of action for the um, last couple of weeks. So, Paul, can you just um, introduce the song now, play, and then tell us when the next um, Zoom gathering is? Thanks very much. Listen to the song. sit alone We do not stand alone We do not walk alone We do not dance alone Unseen Unveiled Him Our God is with us there Emmanuel, Emmanuel Our God is with us there We do not work alone We do not cook alone We do not 
drive along. We do not clean along. Unmade, unchanged. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, our God is with us there. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, our God is with us there. Word made flesh, this is Jesus. Present tense, this is Jesus. Word made flesh, this is Jesus. We do not eat alone We do not sleep alone We do not live alone We will not die alone Unknown, unleashed Him Yeah, thanks for that. Um, sound quality over Zoom is never great, is it? But uh, I think we got the point that God is with us. And, and that's, you know, the opportunity that we, you know, we can pray for. So I'm just going to, I'm going to finish our time together with prayer. Um, and I thank you for joining us this evening. Lord, I just want to pray uh, particularly for the work of Khan. And we thank you for everything that they're doing uh, among black people uh, within our area of the UK. And Lord, I want to pray, Lord, for those things that we've talked about this evening, that, that we can be advocates, uh, we can be people that stand in the gap. Um, but most of all, Lord, we want to pray, Lord, that we make a difference. And uh, so, Lord, I want to pray that uh, there would be an amazing difference made as a result of this conversation this evening and the further conversations we have in the weeks to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Steve, just before we go, could just get Paul to tell us about that, the next Zoom? Yeah, uh, this, is, this was the first of a series of three uh, called Facing Up to Race, um, just as network in partnership with different organizations. The next one is on Wednesday at the same time, seven o'clock. It's called Church Complicity. Make of that what you will. Uh, we've got um, Professor Robert Beckford, who's a theologian, joining us, and also Dr. Joe Aldred, who's from... Um, British something or other of churches, um, but um, I could recommend them both. And also uh, a pastor called Ben Turpin. And uh, that'll be a conversation around issues to do with racism in church, both historical and contemporary. Uh, the third one will be about young people. That's towards the end of the month. Um, information is on the link which I've put up on chat from the Mosaic Network website. You're all welcome. Please uh, bring more people along as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming, everyone. Um, thanks for joining, and uh, just keep keep an eye out for different things that we share. Uh, we're we're trying to get many stories as possible, um, and uh, those stories shared. So thank you all for coming. Uh, have a good evening, and uh, we kept it within the Aaron Quarter, which is amazing. <laughs> so, which is amazing. So thanks for all coming. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>